one. Yeah, it came out and I recorded it in 2006. It came out in 2007. And we're staying on the charts for 46, Jeff, was it 46 or 47 weeks? 47. 47, 47. He wouldn't know, he was the regular that guy. That's not an alternative attack, y'all. That's not an alternative attack, yeah. Y'all might not know this song, it's called Never Would've Made It. Yeah. I'm gonna sing it for you. I'm gonna sing it for you. But we're here to talk about Close, yeah. a beautiful album. What was the inspiration and how did you brave making this album? I mean, you know, the inspiration behind all music that we try to do is to just share songs that will encourage the body. Um, I recognize my sign in the kingdom. You know, everybody can't be a praise and worship singer, a praise and worship right. leader. Some of us have to, you know, write and put together music that really challenges the believer to stand firm in the midst of crises, challenges, and troubles. And uh, because I understand it's my assignment in the kingdom, that's what I've always tried to do. I've always tried to make sure the songs that I sing are, are songs that will solidify, that will encourage, that will uplift. So, you know, when, once you know what your assignment is in the kingdom, you just need to stay true to it. Now let me ask you this, because you know, touch on this briefly, I mean, given everything that we're going through, I mean, we can talk about the president, or we choose to call him the president or not, that's going on, but then you have natural disasters happening. Yeah. It's like revelations. Like we live in real. Yeah, it is real. Yeah. And your album is coming out now. I mean, did you, when you talk about listen, but Scott, like you need to do this now? Like really, what was your push to do this? You know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm probably one of the strangest artists on the planet. I, I don't listen to music until it's time for me to record. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Whenever I approach doing a record, I approach it from a, a preacher's standpoint. Like I've always approached my records like I put together my messages. You know, I always start with an opening statement, a transition sentence. I try to put my three points in my clothes. And uh, that's how I approach, you know, music. So when it came time for me to do a record, I immediately just really began to seek out and said, what, what do you want me to say in the season? Um, not knowing that people were going to have to endure great loss uh, because of hurricanes, not knowing that people were going to have to endure great loss because of earthquakes. Um, I never took that into consideration. I just felt like God wanted me to share with people, uh, you know, that they're not supposed to be weary and want to do it. And in due season, they're going to be harvest if they just stand for a little faint not. So, you know, my music isn't just to encourage people not to faint. And with all of the debauchery and foolishness that we're experiencing, I don't want the believer to get distracted. I want the believer to remain focused. And if they do so, the rest of their days will be the best of their days. Well, let me ask you something, because you yourself, you've been very open about the hardship you have, the loss, but where have you tapped into to push forward and to, to be a vessel, to have a message for the believer? What have you tapped? I mean, you know, I just think that one of the key things is you've got to remain connected to God. You know, I don't know how people go through anything without having a real God conscious and God connection. Because I can legitimately say with all of the loss, and, I mean, you all just know about death. You know, you all don't know about IRS. You all don't know about, I think you know, we do. Well, I, I, yeah, I don't know about IRS. Not, not my IRS situation. <laughs> Thank you. And I lost $400. And it was, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was $1.5 million. Uh, and they came to me like one week after, uh, literally the week after my life, I just buried her. And the IRS hit me with $1.5 million and uh, was talking about taking me to prison, and things of that nature. It was, it was a crazy moment because the questions that they asked me, I could not answer because the person that handled all of my business was in the grave. And um, I cried. Because I'm like, you know, I just lost my wife, and I didn't want to take me away from my kids. And what are you guys trying to do? And I just finally told them, I said, if you, if you just give me the chance, I'll pay you. And I didn't ask God to do like some of y'all. God, give me a computer system. <laughs> 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 I'm trying to get the car. You know, I just hide it. They don't need to see it. Jesus, please hide it. I mean, I don't do that. It took me three years, but I paid. I paid. I never stopped telling you. You said I never stopped telling you. I never stopped giving my offering. 
Um, but it took me three years, and I paid them. So I tell people all the time that you know, you know, I'm, I'm poor cash wise, I'm very poor when it comes to the cash fees. But I'm rich in peace. And, uh, and uh, most importantly, you know, uh, my credit score is back up to 800. So I think. Oh, praise God. That's the best one. But you know, you go through things in life, and and, and I think what God. God wants us to do is all of us. He wants us to be examples. Yeah. You know, we're, it's it's you're not just a Christian. You're a living epistle. Yes. Uh, you, you sometimes you're the only Bible that people will ever right. read. So right. you want to be a living letter yes. to individuals so that they will know that you know they can make it through. And and I know people are watching. You know, millions of people are paying attention to me to see how I'm going to react, to see how I'm going to respond. And. Um, I just I learned I learned how to cast off my cares on me because I know he cares for me. So, you know, I don't stress out like people do. I you know, I just I know he loves me. So because he loves me and because I made a commitment to him by committing my life in servitude to him, that he has an obligation to look out for me to take care of me. And he's done that. He's, he loves to brother up on a consistent basis. He does. He does. He does. He does. Now tell me how, well tell us, how he hooked you up with this song, Close. What was the, you know? <laughs> you know, Close, Close, Close was strange. I was preaching in a very small town outside of Dalston, Georgia. And while I was down there preaching, I was getting ready to get up. The place was jam-packed because this town only had one, one light in the entire city. They didn't have any grocery stores in the city. They had to literally drive like 25, 30 minutes away to go to Walmart or to go to Walgreens or whatever Walmart. And it was just a very, very small country town. And everybody in the city came to hear me preach and sing that night. So the, the gym was jam-packed. It was jam-packed. And this young man got up and sang this song, a version of the song, rather. His name is Solomon Edwards. And he started singing this song. And I, I listened to him and I was like, he's singing my life. But he's also singing the lives of so many others that people get frustrated because when they get hit with adversity, they begin to wonder where God is. But the truth of the matter is that the only reason why the enemy attacks is because you're close. So when he got through singing it, I stood up and I said, uh, hey, young man, you need, to, you need to let me record this song. I said, I promise you if you let me record it, you'll be able to sit at home and get checks in the mail. All right. And uh, when you understand your assignment in the kingdom, I'm, I'm, I'm different. I don't consider myself to be a great singer. I consider myself to be a conduit. And it's, it's my responsibility that since he's giving me a platform, that I have to reach back and bring other people up. That, that's, that's just how I look at it. And that's, that's who I am. I mean, you know, I met a phenomenal young man through Pastor Kenneth Holmes. I never forget it. I met him through Pastor Kenneth Holmes. I was up there preaching, and he brought this young guy. He had these long dreads. And he was very young. He said, man, this boy is a phenomenal writer. And uh, I told him to send me something. And he sent me a song that y'all sing all the time. Y'all didn't, didn't even know who he was, really. They probably knew him out here, but he didn't have a national name. And uh, the song goes, uh, I've got my share of ups and downs. Times wrote that song for me, uh, Praise Him in Advance. And uh, a lot of people knew about they knew about Jonathan Nelson, but nobody knew about Jason Nelson until they heard the song Thirsty. I am thirsty. He wrote that song for me. He wrote, Go find a place of worship. Look into your pain and find your praise. My favorite song. And then uh, another young man by the name of uh, Jonathan Dunn. People still don't know Jonathan. He's not a preacher teacher. But, 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 but Jonathan Dunn wrote, Here I am. I'm still standing where I am after all I've been through. I so, I, so, so God has gifted me, I guess, to, to, to be a, a platform for unknown writers and individuals. And, I, and I, I take pride in that. I take pride in helping. But what's so amazing is, is I told God this a long time ago. I said, I said God, I don't know if I want any more hit songs. And I told him the reason why I didn't want any more hit songs, because every time I write a hit, I got to take a hit. And, and I just, I'm, I'm, I'm good, you know, just, let me tell y'all something. If y'all can't live off of never would have made it, and best in me, and, and uh, uh, my testimony, y'all ain't gonna get no more from me. I'm, I'm, I'm good, I can't take no more. 
because it's, it's too difficult and challenging emotionally to pull your life back together again after you gotta go through so much to pour into people. I'm gonna try to hear what I'm saying. So I told God I wanted more hits, and I heard this song, I said, this is a hit I don't have to write, but you know what ended up happening? The, play, the people I went down there for wore me a bad check. And I still ain't got that check. The check's still bouncing, even as we speak. So I had to take a little hit for this one, but it, it was just a blessing to be able to um, give a young man that nobody ever heard of from Valdosta, Georgia, an opportunity to have a platform. And that's, that's what we're supposed to do. That's king. That's what we're king. Yeah. 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 And I'm glad you sung it live tonight with Listen. And aside from, you know, who wrote the song and, and that, that was going on there, I appreciate it because I do believe in that God speaks to you. He doesn't, he's not loud. The times God has spoken to me, he's been very quiet. He's been like, quiet. Can you share with us the first time, or most profound time God has spoken to you? I think the most profound time that God has spoken to me, honestly, is um, the day I made the decision that I was going to ask my wife to marry. Right. Wow. I'm, I'm going to tell you what was so profound about that because um, we literally had just started dating. We grew up together. Went to elementary school, middle school, high school, double dating for the senior prom. And I took her out on a date to a place called the Spinnaker. It was like the top little restaurant in our city. And I was like, you know, I'm trying to impress this girl, you know. You know, I know she know me as a friend, but I just want to take it to some place real nice. So took it to the spinnaker, and it was just a horrible experience. <laughs> um, and she said something to me when I began to take her home. I took her home, and I was afraid to kiss her and all that kind of stuff. So I pulled up, and, you know, I walked to the door and walked away real quick. And while I was walking away, she said, Marvin, why don't you come to my house for Sunday dinner? All right. And I said, okay, cool. She said, I'm going to cook some food for us. And, you know, you come to Sunday, and I was like, okay, cool. So went to the same church after church. I get to the house, pull up at the house. Actually, she rode home with me. And we went to the house. I walked in the house. I was like, hold up, you got to cook. So I'm sitting in the kitchen with her, and she puts on the apron, and she pulls out the chicken, and she starts to prepare the chicken to be barbecued, and some to be fried, and then she takes out the greens, and she begins to wash them and cut them. And we're talking to that two hours to the way. Wait, 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 so we have a discussion and conversation and she's making the greens and then she makes the macaroni and cheese from scratch with the with the uh, with the uh, cheese in it that has like the jalapeno chips in it and then she you know she, she makes all of this in her candy games, all of this and she be just talking while she's cooking. So then she gets through cooking and her mother comes in, and her mother comes in from work and we can sit and talk and I can this food. And all of a sudden I'm sitting on the couch and thinking about watching television and all of a sudden I fall asleep. So I wake up and I was like, oh my God. And I said, how long have I been sleeping? She said, you can sleep for about an hour. And we had night service. So I said, let me get home. So I jumped in the car over around the corner um, so I could get changed up. And I walked in the door and I told my mother, I said, I'm marrying that girl. I'm marrying that girl right there. I'm marrying that girl. And because God spoke to me not in a voice. He spoke to me through how she served. Yeah. He spoke to me through how she served me, that she she made me feel special. She made me feel like a man, even when I wasn't her man at that point. And uh, because she did that, I made a commitment that I was going to treat her like the queen that she was, not only in life, but in death as well. There was nothing my wife could even look at if she looked at it long enough. I would break my back, I would dig ditches and do whatever it took just so she could have it. And because she made major, major sacrifices for me. And uh, she did things for me that uh, she made it hard. For the next one. I don't know if there's gonna be a next one. Um, but she's 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 made it extremely hard. Not that I'm living in my history, because I'm not, but you you you've gotta have standards. And I think I think at this particular point in time in my life too, it was it was easy to find a mate when I was broke. Now, now you begin to wonder, you know, motives and you know why people want you. Are they more impressed with who you are as an invisible, visual, highly sought after? 
preacher, teacher, singer, yeah. or do they want to get to know you for you? So, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, it's been seven years, and, uh, yeah, it was seven years, three weeks ago. It's been seven years, and uh, you know, I'm cool, I'm chilling. I mean, I'm, I'm, when I tell you I'm loving life right now, this, this, I can go where I want to go, buy what I want to buy. I ain't got to come home if I don't want to come home. This time I just have to hide stuff in the trunk of the car. I ain't got to do that no more. I ain't got to put that back in the closet. There's certain, I miss a lot of things about her, but those things I don't miss. You know, her telling me, Marvin, you don't need that. Marvin, you don't need that. Like, yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. I do. I do. I do. But, but it's, it's, uh, it's been a good ride. I appreciate it. Now my coworker at Essence told me you guys had a good chat and you oh, and you have a you've been passing somewhat of the time loving reality TV. Oh God! <laughs> Why she tell you that? She <laughs> low down. That's my She's favorite. like part of my friend. Part of my friend. My friend. My friend. Yeah, I you know I, I have a um I started I started watching reality television because everybody got a guilty pleasure. I don't care what y'all say. All of us got proclivities, and the reality is, is I like ratchet. I like ratchet. Oh, ratchet yeah. I'm not gonna lie. I, I really, everybody enjoy a little ratchet in your life. I don't care what you say. So I started watching ratchet television during the time of uh, you know uh, 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 loving Flavor Flav. You know, I started. Y'all you know, remember when Flav gave her the, the grill? Gave her the grill. So I started watching reality television back then, and uh, that's my Sunday night guilty pleasure. Believe it or not, I go home and. I watch me see, you know, love and hip hop. Hollywood. Watch that landing. I know Carly Red. Don't play. Don't play. <laughs> you know, I'm the, you know. Please just get out of here. I'm telling you right now, I'm, listen, they better not put it on Netflix. I'm going to watch it. Oh, I'm looking every, every season. Just in case I miss a few. Share with us, you and me, with uh, Erica Campbell. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious, why Erica Campbell? I mean, I love Erica, but for this to be your first collaboration, what made her be the one? Well, I, you know what? Honestly, we were in the studio in LA, mm -hmm. and we was like, we need to get somebody on this thing that's hot. Yeah. And uh, Aaron said, hey man, what you think about Erica? I said, I think that would be phenomenal. He said, I'm gonna call her. So they were out there doing um, their reality show, and she had a break. So she said, oh, I'm gonna come through. And that's really kind of like how it happened. She just came through, that and it was that organic, and she got on the vocals, and I was like, man, we got something here. This is, this is gonna be really nice. I stretched a little bit on this record, um, but, but when you listen to the rest of it, you know, I didn't, I didn't leave my bass. You know, uh, there's songs on there. My, one of my favorite songs is called Carry Me. It's, it's going to bless y'all. And uh, then uh, Face to Face is a great song over there as well. I mean, it's, I think it's just a, a very complete project. I think so. All right, before I open it up to the audience, so remember if you have any questions, I'm curious, how do you keep your music authentic? I mean, because I think it'd be one thing as a gospel artist to be like, okay, we put the scripture in there and we do this. But how do you make it resonate with so many? I think, for me, like, I, when I look back at Never Would've Made It, you know, Never Would've Made It work because so many people have had Never Would've Made It moments. And because they've had those moments, the song resonated. Um, same thing with the best of me. You know, I, I look at best of me and I, I think about people who have had folks in their lives to tell them that they weren't valuable or had no value. Um, but, you know, it was good that God didn't see them the same way other folks saw. Um, so, so whenever I approach music um, and approach songwriting, I always approach it from the standpoint of trying to think like everybody else. Because, you know, uh, I was the least of these. To be honest with you, you know, I, you know, I never won a talent show. I lost every talent show I was ever in. Uh, I didn't make the, the best choir in the school, you know, I was in the worst choir in the school because I wasn't good enough to be the best. Um, I was the run of the litter, believe it or not, I was five foot two and I weighed about 125 pounds until I was 20 years old, from 12 to 20. And then all of a sudden at 20, I grew seven inches uh, both directions. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but 
you know, you, you just, I don't know, you know, I just, I think about my own life situations and, and what I've had to go through, and, and then we just try to put pen to paper, and then after we put pen to paper, we put melody to lyrics, and then once we put melody to lyrics, it becomes a song that's transformation. Does anyone have any questions for Pastor? Don't be shy. The saints don't ask no questions. Don't they they, they can be asking questions. Oh, there's one right here. Yeah, well, yes. Stand up, stand up, stand up. Can somebody bring the mic to her, please? Yes, Valerie. Thank you. Uh, what I wanted to know is how do you manage to balance your ministry your music. Excellent question. Her question was, how do I manage to balance ministry from a pastoral standpoint with my music? Well, the first thing I don't do is balance it. Because anything that you balance, you can fall off balance. What I do is I prioritize. I put things in proper order. When you prioritize, that means that that which you value the most, you put at the top of your list. Since I'm a father first, that's my first priority. My first ministry is my three babies, Marvin, Michaela, and Madison. They are my first ministry. I made a conscious decision a long time ago that there's no way possible I'm gonna be out here renting the world for Christ and losing my house. I will shut down every song, every trip, every preaching engagement because I will not lose my children trying to win yours. I didn't hate them, I'm just being honest. So um, I put, I, I made a commitment to put, especially after the past and the mother, I made a commitment to put all of my energy and my efforts into making sure and ensuring that they were well-rounded, productive, Christian individuals. And uh, you know, you train them up in the way they should go, they gonna veer, you know, that's just normal. You know, they gonna test their wings, but when you put it in them, it's gonna stay in them. So, um, Marvin is doing exceptionally well. He's 23, about to graduate from Howard University and uh, in law school. And then my middle child, Michaela, blew my mind. She just, I picked with her, she just had a revival. No, I'm just kidding, it wasn't a revival. But um, she wrote a book when she was 13 years of age uh, called the, the Girl Behind the Mask, The Diary of Marvin Sam's Daughter. And that was seven years ago. And a church actually read the book and they invited her this weekend. She had her first out-of-town speaking engagement in Schenectady, New York. And uh, I was blown away because that was my child that had dyslexia and, and just really struggled in school. And now she has like a 3.8 grade point average at uh, Alabama yeah. University. Yeah. And then my baby girl, Madison, she goes to Alabama and the University with her sister. So um, all of my children are HBCU babies. And that's my first priority, my first priority. After, after I, I, I take care of my children, then I take care of my pastoral responsibilities. I pastor two churches, my house for life Center church in Grand Rapids and Mesquite. After that, it's my music ministry. And then after that, it's my entrepreneurial efforts. I do too much stuff. I have schools, daycares, restaurants, full service body, uh, full service uh, uh, spas, and trying to get, I'm trying to buy, even now, uh, a mortuary situation, a funeral home. I, I believe in multiple streams. Yes, I believe in it, I believe in it. Because, because I'm, no disrespect to any gospel music artist, I will not be 80 years old. Come on, I'm not doing it. I'm going to be sitting someplace relaxing. So if you prioritize things the way they're supposed to be prioritized, God will allow you to be able to be successful Amen. in all of them when you put them in the Amen. proper order. Amen. From Amen. Amen. Anybody else got any questions? Now, wait, I'm listening to you say all that, but when it's time for Marvin, Marvin. When, what is your self care? Well, you know what, honestly, um, I enjoy what I do so much. Ah, there you go. Uh, and I've learned a very valuable lesson. Busy keeps you out of trouble. I think you need to repeat that. Yeah, see, busy, busy, busy keeps you out of trouble. So I know it's not biblical, but an idle mind is absolutely the devil's workshop. So I believe that if I remain busy, then I won't find myself being caught up 
in situations that could cause things to happen in my life that, that I um, could have avoided. So I remain busy. Self-care stuff, I go on vacation twice a year. I do take some time to myself. You know, people ask me what's my hobby. I go to the gun range. Yes. Every month, I'm at the gun range. You know, I, I go to the gun range. In fact, I just, I just bought a wonderful piece, Kim. I just bought a, a Kimber 357 Magnum. That's a wonderful thing. Oh my God. So I, I go to the gun range uh, every Monday. I shoot about about 200 rounds every Monday with, with different guns that I have, like Glock 43, Glock 42, uh, Sig. P230, uh, P290, yeah. um, M4, assault rifle. So, I mean, there's certain things I like to do, and that's my passion. I'm just watching a show, being caught up on a show, and one of the lines, this is so star. Queen Latifah said, her father, her character said, her father taught her, you, you have your word, you have your Bible, you have your gun. <laughs> yeah. The weapons of my warfare are gone. <laughs> <laughs> and they're mighty to pull it down. <laughs> That's just, I, I, I'm just playing, I don't want to mess with the scripture, but uh, you, you gotta find an outlet, you know. Yeah. And some people like to go golfing, you know, some people, you know, like to go to the spa, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, you know, that's your thing, that's your thing, but you know, you know, I, I like going, you know, shooting, shooting guns. <laughs> I guess, you know, I'm not a crook or nothing, but I just, a, a brother from my church actually, one of the brothers from my church took me, because they said, Bishop, you need a hobby. And I was like, I don't have a hobby. They said, you really need one. And they took me to the gun range, and when I pulled the trigger, that was it. The first time I pulled the trigger, I was like, whoa! I was so happy, I went and bought a gun that night. I did, I did, I did, I did. I did. I bought my first Glock, my Glock 19, that I sure did, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's always stack 15, I know, I know. I know. I know. I see the next reality show, Glock <laughs> B and G's. Yes. <laughs> well, I think we would love to hear yeah. a little yeah. song you yeah. 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 Just a little bit. Just a little bit of that? Yeah. Play it, play it. Let's, let's see if they know this. Let me see. What? I know we are. 